If you want to be an overpaid employee, there are three things that you have to understand. Number one is you have to understand the company's financials. Number two, you have to know how to make yourself irreplaceable as an employee. And then number three is you got to know how to get your piece of the pie, meaning how do you get that overpaid salary now? Now, I have hired and fired multiple people at my company, Briefs Media, so I know a thing or two about how you can increase the income that you get. And the first thing that you have to understand if you want to maximize your salary is how your salary plays a part in the company's finances because the reality is when you work in a company, you are an expense at the company. Let me show you. Every single company has three main financial statements. They have number one, what's called an income statement. This is what shows your income minus your expenses, also known as a profit and loss statement. Then you have something called a balance sheet. This shows essentially the net worth of a company. This shows the assets minus liabilities. And then you have what's called the cash flow statement, which shows how the cash flowed through the company. When you work in a company and you're getting paid a salary, you are an expense for the company. Because now what they're showing is they have this income, whatever money they're making by selling their stuff. And then they have to subtract their expenses because now in order to sell their stuff, they got to pay salaries, they got to pay rent, they got to pay for everything in between in order to make the money to actually run the business. So now when you're getting paid a salary, you are a bigger expense. And when companies can cut their expenses, they have more income, which means a bigger profit and more profit means more value as the company. And this is where now you have to understand this because companies want to reduce their expenses because they want to increase their profit. And the reason they want to increase their profit is because now this makes the company more valuable. Just take a look. When you see companies like Roku or Meta lay off employees, you see the stock price of this company go up because their expenses are being decreased. Because remember, a company's in the business of making a profit. They want to maximize this. So when a company is paying out a salary to you, this is an expense which is lowering the profit, which is why now, if you are working in a company, you want to do number two, make yourself irreplaceable because in this balance sheet, you have assets and then you have liabilities. I'll shorten it, assets minus liabilities. And you want to make yourself now an asset for the company. Now, if at this point of the video, you're thinking something along the lines of, but Jaspreet, I'm only making $50,000 a year while my boss is making $100,000 a year off of me. I want you to hold that thought because we're gonna get to that in part number three. Number two is about now, how do you make yourself an asset in the company? Now, when a company looks at their balance sheet, what they're looking at is assets that they actually own, things like their real estate, things like their machinery, and then they subtract the liabilities, things like their debt. This gives the net worth of a company. So you're not technically shown on the balance sheet of a company. However, you need to become an asset of a company because if a company owns a good asset, like a really good piece of real estate, they're not gonna wanna get rid of it because they're getting so much money, so much demand, so much business from this asset. And you need to turn yourself into this asset, especially in today's day and age, because well, if you are not an asset in a company, then the company is not gonna feel the need to maximize your salary because, well, they don't see that real asset value inside of you. If you can make yourself irreplaceable, because now you're coming to work and you're putting in the effort, you're putting in the hard work, you're putting in the hours, and you're learning and you're being creative and you're adding more value to this bottom line, well, they're gonna be willing to pay you more money. Because if you are an expense that's adding more income, well, then that's a net positive on the profit side. And that's the key now to get you to actually get the bigger piece of the pie is you have to be able to contribute more money to the company. Because if somebody else can come in and do your job better than you, if somebody else can come in and add more profit to the company than what you're doing, then you are a negative expense that could be removed and somebody else can come in as an expense but add more income than what they're losing and that would mean a bigger profit for the company. Now, when I say things like this, you generally hear people get very upset. Oh, this is so bad. You have these greedy business owners that are doing this and that, and all people want to do is maximize their profits. Yes, a business is in the business of maximizing the profit. A business is not in the business of making sure that their employees are happy. Now, you might hear that and say, just put that's really mean. I will explain what I mean by this in part number three, but a business is in the business of making a profit. 
Can happy employees make a better profit? 100%. A business should want to have happy employees. I don't understand why businesses wouldn't want to do that. But what you have to understand is that a business's number one goal is to maximize the shareholder value. It is to maximize the profit. And if you want to get the most value for yourself, for your life out of the business, you have to understand the name of the game for the business because the business wants this. And this brings me to the third point that you have to understand now is how do you get your piece of the pie? When most people talk about maximizing their income, what they're thinking about doing is doing this, climbing up the corporate ladder in this way where now you're working harder, that way you can keep getting your promotions, keep getting more income. Now, this is a start. Right? If you are climbing your way up this ladder, you are keeping yourself as an irreplaceable employee because once you go higher, you become more and more valuable in the company, which means you're also making more money. But every single person in here, even the CEO of a company, is working for somebody else because yes, the CEO does have a boss. These people are working for the shareholders, the owners of the company. And so now, if you really want to maximize your income, what you need to do is figure out how can you not just climb the corporate ladder, but own a piece of the corporate ladder. Now, of course, as you work to climb the corporate ladder, as you work to earn more money, as you work to make the company more money, you will make a bigger income. If you don't, there's something wrong with your company. However, if you really want to maximize the money that you get, you have to figure out how to own a piece of the company. Because like I said just a minute ago, if you're making $50,000 a year, your company is probably making $100,000 a year off of you. So now, if the company is making 50 grand and you're only making 50 grand, how do you get a piece of that $50,000? Because that's the company's income. If you want to own a piece of the company's income, you have to own a piece of the company, which means you got to become one of the shareholders. Now, either this means you go out and start a company or you can take a piece of the money that you're making and use it to buy a piece of the company. So, if your company is publicly traded on the stock market and you like your company, you believe in the value of your company, you can take some of the money that you're making and go out and buy a piece of that. Or if your company is not traded on the stock market and your company offers you a piece of equity, well now maybe you get the equity by working or negotiating your income with some equity or ownership in the company. Not every company is going to allow for that, but some companies will allow you to get an income based off of your equity. If you look at some of the most highest paid CEOs in the country, they're not getting paid just a flat salary, they're getting paid with equity, ownership. Because now you're not just getting paid no matter what, you're getting paid based off of the profit that you can generate here through the company. And this goes back to the question that I was talking about just a couple minutes ago, which is what is the goal of a company? The goal of the company is not to make their employees happy. The goal of the company is not to make their customers happy. The goal of the company is to make the shareholders richer. This is the fiduciary duty of a company. Their goal is to increase the shareholder value, meaning the goal of a company is to drive up the value of the company, drive up the profits to drive up the shareholder value. Now, in order to do that, a good company, a healthy company, would want to make sure they have happy customers because if you have happy customers, they're gonna keep coming back. A good and healthy company is gonna to wanna to make sure they have happy employees, because if you have happy employees, they're gonna to wanna to work harder. They're gonna to wanna to keep coming back, because if an employee feels happy working at this company, they're gonna to wanna to keep driving value. Now, not every company thinks that way. Every company has their own vision of what is a happy employee or a happy customer, but at the end of the day, the profits do not go to the employees, generally. Now, in some companies, you have exceptions to this, but in general, when you're getting paid as an employee, you are getting paid a salary, which means you're getting paid to do a certain thing. And if you are replaceable to do that certain thing, you are just gonna be paid whatever the market's gonna be willing to pay. But if you can drive up your value and you can make yourself more irreplaceable, now you can drive up your salary. But then if you really want to maximize your income, that means you're gonna have to own a piece of the profits. And a way that you get a piece of the profits is either the company pays you with equity, which is available in some instances, or you work to now take the money that you're making and use it to buy some equity. Maybe it's your own company, maybe it's somebody else's company, but you have to own some of this equity 
That way now you can benefit from the profits as well because the profits go to the owners, the profits don't go to the employees. This is a basic fundamental concept of our economic system that we should have been taught in school. But if you want to get a piece of the profits, you have to be one of the owners. And the nice thing about this, because there are some nice things about this, is it has become so much more accessible than ever before for anybody to become one of the owners because now we have access to a bunch of tools and apps that will allow you to invest in companies on the stock market and even invest into startup companies with as little as $100, I mean, even $10 nowadays. So if you have a little bit of extra money, now you can start taking this money to start owning the company instead of just buying the Apple products, instead of just buying the Lululemon products, instead of just buying the extra guac from Chipotle, now you can own a piece of the company that way as the company makes more money, as the company gets more employees, as the company makes employees work hard, you own a piece of the profits and you get those profits without having to work in the company. So the shareholders are not the ones working in the company. The employees are the ones that are working to drive up the profits of the company. If you want to make the most money, you got to own the profits, which you get not from working in the company. You do that from buying the company while working to drive up your income by working in the company. That way you can own more equity outside of the company. We are seeing a big shift in the job market right now where employers are needing more work, more productivity, and more efficiency out of their employees, and employees feel like they're being overworked and underpaid. Just yesterday, I went to a local print shop near my office to go get something. It's actually not a local one. It's a big franchise, but it, it was the one near my office. I walk in, and all the employees in this print shop are having this big dispute behind the cash register. Now, they're being very loud, so it's easy to hear what they're saying. And what the employees were saying was essentially, we have been seeing our hours be cut week after week after week gradually that the employees that used to work 40 to 45 hours a week are now only getting 30 to 35 hours a week worth of work. And every week for the last number of weeks, they have been seeing their hours cut by one to two hours. Now, what does this mean? It means that the employees are making less money. And if you're making less money, well, that means you have less money to go out and pay for your life. And if you have less money to pay for your life in a time where everything keeps getting more expensive, you can see what the problem is. But what's happening now on the employer side is some employers are seeing, well, either we're not making enough money anymore or our expenses have gone up so much that we need to reduce some of these expenses because inflation has made everything more expensive. And we're starting to see this big kind of butting of heads between employers and employees. Now there's always been some contention between employers and employees, but for the last number of years, we've seen a lot of power go to the hands of the employees because, well, all this money went into the economy. Employers had tons of money and they wanted to grow their businesses rapidly because everybody had free money. And so now employers are growing, they're opening new stores, they're opening new manufacturing facilities, they're expanding and they're hiring people like crazy. And now employers need workers more than workers need jobs. So for the last few years, employees had had a major upper hand where you could say, you know what? I don't want to come into the office. I want to work from home. I want a bigger raise. I want bigger benefits. And for the most part, employees have been able to get these benefits where you could get better pay, you can get better perks, and get better rewards for working at a particular company. Now we're starting to see this slowly switch. Now, of course, part of the reason for this is because of the higher interest rates, but we're seeing this happen in real time right now, where you're starting to see that switch in the employer model where employers are now being much pickier when they hire employees. They're demanding more work from employees and they're not paying out as many bonuses and perks as they were before. In fact, you're seeing some companies actually reduce some of their bonuses, perks, and even salaries because, well, the economy is starting to change. And so what we saw over the last few years is that employees had the upper hand. Now you're starting to see this kind of balance out. Just take a look. The Frontier CEO came out recently and said that employees have become lazy after the pandemic, and it's crazy that people are not going back into the office yet. Let me actually read you a line of what the Frontier Airlines CEO said during a conference with Morgan Stanley. We got lazy in COVID. I mean, seriously, people are still allowing other people to work from home? All this is silliness, right? All that's out of the window now. Now, of course, Frontier Airlines is not the only company that has been asking employees to come back into the office. We have a number of companies around the country that have been 
and saying essentially you better come back into the office or just don't come back to the company at all because now companies, many companies at least, are forcing their employees to return back to the office. Now naturally, you have a lot of employees that are feeling a little bit of resistance to this thing. Wait, we don't want to come back to the office. We don't want to have to commute back to the office and we feel like we're productive enough at home or that we're even more productive at home. So you can start to see where this contention is happening. Well, the problem is we are entering a time where we're seeing that change in the economy. We're seeing some companies see slower sales. We're seeing some slowdown in growth. And so when you are a company or the executives of a company and your job is to increase profitability, increase sales, and increase the value of the company, you want to make sure that your team is being as productive as possible. At the end of the day, if you are the executive of a company, your job is to make sure that your company is making the most money. Period. Right? That's what a company does. And so now, when you're looking at the numbers and you're saying, okay, our expenses are rising due to inflation because the cost of everything, not just for consumers, but also for businesses, everything is more expensive. Not to mention the fact that our labor costs are also higher because companies are paying way higher salaries today than they were three years ago, thank you to inflation. And so now companies are saying, well, our expenses are higher and our revenues are not potentially growing fast enough. And if our revenues are not growing fast enough, we need to grow our revenues faster. And this is coming at a time where we're seeing that slowdown in the economy. And this is why you're seeing a lot of employers say, we need people to be more productive. We need people to be more creative. We need people to put in more effort. We need people to put in more hours. So let's get people back into the office where we have a little bit more control and where we can also foster more creative growth. Because if people are working from home, sometimes they have to wait longer to get somebody's response. Sometimes the meetings are not as productive. Sometimes somebody's internet's not working. Sometimes things just don't go as well. Now, for some people, they say, well, I'm way more productive at home. I can do more things. I don't have to waste time driving. This is where now employers are having to make the decision as to what is the most productive and efficient and profitable item for them. Because, of course, if employees are not coming into the office, well, now you can have less expenses as an employer because now you don't have to have as big of an office. You don't have to have as many office expenses. You don't have to pay for all the utilities. But if a company feels like people are more productive in the office, now you have higher office expenses, but you would hope now that you're going to be able to drive more revenue and more profits because people are being more productive in the company, in the office. And this is where employees are saying, well, I'm not making enough money. This is tough because the cost of living is rising so quickly and the salary that I'm getting is not justifying me to either continue working here or it's making it harder for me to survive. And this is a big dilemma. And the reason why this is such a big dilemma is because employers are struggling to pay some of their employees more because some of them are struggling to make more money. Now, of course, this is not a universal statement. Some companies are making more money. Some companies are making less money. But what we're seeing across the board is that we are seeing kind of a slowdown in growth across the country, across the economy. And so if companies are seeing a slowdown in growth, while employees keep wanting more money, that means profits are not growing as fast, while expenses could be rising even faster. You can start to see why that's a problem. And so now if you're a company or an executive and you're saying, well, we keep needing more expenses because people want more money to work, well, we're not making enough money, we're gonna need more productivity out of our employees. This is the shift that we're starting to see in the economy. And the question is, what is driving this shift and where is this shift going to be over the next 12 months? Because this is something you need to know whether you are an employer or an employee. Now, we've been covering this in Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter. If you have not joined Market Briefs yet, it is a free and easy way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in things like the housing market, the economy, the stock market, the crypto market, and the global economy. You can read Market Briefs in less than five minutes every morning, and it's completely free. So if you have not joined Market Briefs, I got the link for you down in the description below where you can go to briefs.co slash market. Now, why are we seeing this big shift in the economy? Because all the free money that we have been seeing enter our economy in 2020, 2021, and 2022 is now going away. In March of 2022, the Federal Reserve Bank started raising interest rates. What did they do? They made money a little bit more expensive, and that started to pull all this free money out of the economy. It started to do that. Now, here we are in 2023, and it doesn't look like the Federal Reserve Bank is done raising interest rates yet, even though we have seen the fastest run up in interest rates since the early 1980s. And so now we are seeing the highest interest rates in more than two decades. We are seeing the fastest growth in interest rates in more than four decades. And now it doesn't look like the higher interest rates are going away anytime soon because while well, the Federal Reserve Bank has been working to raise interest rates to cool down inflation and over the last few months, 
we have not been seeing inflation fall. In fact, we have been seeing inflation rise and accelerate faster. You can see why that poses a problem for the Federal Reserve Bank, because now here we have the situation. Employees feel like they're not making enough money because the cost of living is growing faster than wages. Employers are not making enough money because, well, spending is slowing. Economic growth is slowing and the costs are rising. And so now employers need more work. Employees are stuck saying we need more money. Employers are struggling to pay out sometimes higher salaries. Employees are saying, I can't afford to keep funding my lifestyle. And so this is that dilemma now that the Federal Reserve Bank is working to solve and they don't want to see an economic slowdown. However, the problem is raising interest rates have consequences, but high inflation also has consequences. And so now when you kind of forecast what's gonna be coming over the next 12 months, you have to project that there's going to be some sort of economic pain because we have seen the most amount of money printing ever between 2020 and 2022. Now we're seeing the fastest growth in interest rates in more than four decades. We are not used to being in an economy with more elevated interest rates. Now, interest rates today are historically not that high, but if you compare it to the last couple of decades, yes, it is high interest rates. And so now we're starting to see this dilemma start to develop. It hasn't fully hit the market's full force yet, but just starting to see it develop in more and more places. I've been seeing it more and more places in different stores that I go to, whether it's in Michigan, whether it's in New York, whether it's in California. And this is where now you're starting to see the kind of the imbalance of power between the employers and the employees, where now employers are starting to be much more pickier. Before it was the employees that were much more pickier. Now the employers are starting to get a little bit more upper hand because they need more productive work. And if you're not willing to do that work, well, they might be willing to let you go because they're already looking for ways to cut their expenses. So what I want you to understand is this shift is happening. We are seeing a shift in the economy, period. Why is this shift happening? Well, you can go back to what the Federal Reserve Bank has been doing. I've covered that in many videos. You can watch that on my channel if you want to learn more about the ins and outs of inflation and what has caused this economic situation that we are in right now. However, the reality is we are in this situation. The Federal Reserve Bank is going to be continuing to fight inflation. That has more impacts on the economy at a time where inflation is still hot. And so what you need to understand now as an employee is number one, how do you protect your income? Number two, how do you use your money smartly? Because the reality is most Americans, the vast majority of Americans are not using their money smartly. So there are ways to use your income better. And number three is how do you protect and grow real wealth? This is what financial education is all about. Because what most people do is they rely on their salary to become wealthy. That if I make more money, I can have a bigger car. If I make more money, I can have a bigger home. If I make more money, I can have better vacations. That's not what wealthy people want to do. Wealthy people want more money, that way they can buy more investments because then these investments will pay for their lifestyle. You don't need a ton of money to start doing this. You can start doing this with as little as $100. But the reality is you have to start understanding how investing works and how to be more financially educated. And the employer side, the reality is pretty much every employer across the country is gonna need more productive work out of the employees. And most employers need their employees to be more creative. Now, it depends on the company. Some companies can run just fine remotely. Some companies need more creative juice. If you're working for a startup, if you're working for more of an edgy growth type company, yeah, people need to be together because that's how you collaborate. That's how you come up with ideas. That's how you can work together long hours and come up with better things to do. That's what every startup has done in the past. So if you're working for a startup or a growth or one of these edgy type of companies, you can see why there's value in coming into the office. If you're working for more of an established company where all you're doing is really just putting this into this and you're just plugging numbers into an Excel spreadsheet, then it doesn't really matter who you're talking to. It doesn't really matter how your collaborations happen, but that's where now some companies feel like it might be better for you to come in and it really just depends on what the company is. So you kind of want to start putting yourself into the shoes of your employer because now employers are looking at where the economy is today and where the economy is going to be in 12 and 24 months. And now they're trying to protect themselves and grow themselves. That way they're not in a position of potential pain if the economy continues to slow. So what does this mean? Well, number one, 2023 is not the year for you to go out and finance a new truck. I've been saying this a lot now, but the reason why is because this is the time for you to get financially smart and financially educated. But then number two, understand what's going on, not just on the employee side, but also the employer side, because that's going to help you make better decisions for yourself. Next time you get paid, there are three things that I want you to do with your paycheck that will allow you to build more wealth from your salary. Number one is figure out how you can get some of your money back from the IRS. 
If you work a job, you get a salary, your taxes are automatically deducted from your paycheck. Well, many Americans are overpaying on their taxes, and this is where, unfortunately, it's your job to figure out how you can get some of the money back. Number two is figure out how you can systemize your money, or as what some people like to call it, give a job to every dollar that you earn. This is what wealthy people do. Wealthy people give every dollar that they earn a job, that way they know what to do with the money, that way they don't accidentally blow all of their money, because if you don't blow all of your money, that's gonna give you the opportunity to three, grow your wealth as well. But in order to do this, you need some money left over from your paycheck because you're working hard to generate an income. You want your money also working hard to make you wealthier as well. And that money that you have working for you can work 24 hours a day while you can't. And this is what wealthy people understand. But in order to do this, you have to understand this. But let's start by talking about number one, how can you get some of your money back from the IRS? Now, of course, I gotta start this section with a little bit of a disclaimer because although I am a licensed attorney, I'm not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions, please talk to a licensed tax advisor in your area because, well, if you mess around with the IRS, not only can you get hit with a big fine, but you can also end up in jail and neither of us want that, right? So let's talk about taxes. When you get paid with a salary, your taxes are automatically pulled out of your salary. So if you get a job that's paying you, let's just say $50,000 a year, what happens is the first thing is you're gonna pay taxes. And now most Americans will not even know or care about how much money this is because this money is not with your bank account. You will end up with something around $40,000 depending on where you live. Now these taxes are gonna be your federal income taxes, your state income taxes, and then you also have your FICA taxes. Taxes, taxes, and taxes. Now, the question that you should have is how can you get some of this money back? Because you earned 50, but you only got to keep $40,000. And the way that you do that is by understanding a little bit of how the IRS tax code works. That the most obvious and most accessible thing that people have is, well, you can invest some of your money into something like a 401k or an IRA because these traditional 401ks and IRAs will allow you to invest some of this money, your salary, tax-free into these accounts. You can compare that to something like a Roth IRA or a Roth 401k, because a Roth 401k and a Roth IRA mean that you invest this after tax dollars. So you pay taxes first, and then you invest what's left. Now, the option that's gonna be better for you, whether it's a Roth IRA or Roth 401k versus a traditional 401k or traditional IRA, is really gonna depend on your personal financial situation because the argument that everybody likes to make here with the traditional accounts is if you don't pay taxes today, you have more money that goes into your accounts, your money can grow tax-free, and then when you pull your money out, will you pay taxes at the end? And when you're 65 years old and you're retired, you're gonna have no income, so now you can pull your money out at a lower tax bracket, hopefully, and have less taxes that you have to pay. That's the hope. However, there's a couple of concerns with that and a couple of issues I do want to address. Number one is that we have no idea what tax rates are going to be in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years. So there's a chance that tax rates could be higher, especially considering the growing level of national debt that we have. Of course, that's a big question mark, but that's something for you to consider. And number two is what type of income do you expect to have when you retire? Is your goal to have no income or is your goal to have a whole bunch of income depending on what you do with your money and your other business ventures or whatever? If you plan to have no income, then sure, that's probably a good option because if you have no income, then just lower tax brackets. But if you plan to invest for cash flow, if you plan to start your own business, if you plan to have some career that's gonna give you a big income in the future that you don't wanna retire from, then that could be problematic because now you have a high income, higher tax brackets, and potentially higher tax rates. So that could be a con for somebody who's thinking about the traditional. For the Roth, the idea here now is you pay taxes today, and you know what tax rates are today, and then your money's gonna grow tax-free, although it's starting with a smaller sum of money, and then when you turn older, you're ready to retire and you start pulling this money out, you can generally pull the money out tax-free and you no longer have to worry about what tax rates are because you paid taxes in the beginning. Now, this is where, again, you gotta decide, is this going to be better for you? If you plan on having more money in the future, if you don't wanna have to deal with potential higher tax rates in the future because nobody knows what tax rates are gonna be next year, let alone in 40 years, well, this gives you a little bit more certainty. So you just gotta figure out which one's the right option. After this, the next thing you wanna think about is maximizing your deductions. Now, even though you are a salaried person, 
it might make sense for you to go out and pay for an accountant's advice once in a while. You don't want to pay $10,000 a year for an accountant or even $5,000 a year, but maybe a few hundred dollars every once in a while to get some basic advice on if you are maximizing your tax deductions or not. Because as an attorney who's not your attorney, who spent a lot of time studying the tax law, what I can tell you is that the tax law is very complex. And well, there's a lot of deductions out there that most people don't even know about. And this is where it's very important for you to understand if you are maximizing your deductions or not, because you want to make sure that you can get the biggest and best write-offs possible, and they are changing year after year after year. So that's the second thing you want to consider, is talking to a tax advisor. Then the third thing that you want to consider, which is the least accessible, but can give you the biggest write-offs and some of the most money back, is creating your own income as well. Working to create your own side hustle, even if you have your own job. It doesn't have to be a major side hustle, just something that you want to work on on the side. Maybe it's a little hobby YouTube channel, maybe it's a blog that you want to build, and some sort of side business. Because the reason is, now when you go out to create your own income, you become a small business owner. And when you're a small business owner, you open up a whole new world of deductions. And what is that world of deductions? Well, as a small business owner, you get to deduct ordinary and necessary expenses to run your business. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to start a cooking YouTube channel to share your great recipes on how to cook carrot cakes and everything else. Well, in order to run this business, what do you need? Well, you might need a laptop to run this business. That could potentially be a business expense. You might need a cell phone to run this business. That could be another business expense, not to mention all the other carrier fees and stuff to have that cell phone. Maybe you need to do a kitchen remodel in your house to have a nice kitchen to make these videos. That could also potentially, arguably, be a business expense. You might not be able to deduct all of it because that kitchen is also being used for personal expenses, but there could be a portion of that renovation that could be used as a deduction. Again, this is where now, if you're working to create a new income, if you're working to build your own business, now you have opened up the doors to ordinary and necessary expenses that you can write off. And so now, if you're working to create an income, if you're working to build a side hustle in addition to your business, now you can finally make these deductions because, well, these deductions are reserved for business owners. But anybody can be a business owner. You don't have to be making millions of dollars a year to classify as a business owner. You could start a blog, a YouTube channel, some sort of side hustle to start trying to generate an income. And if you're working to generate an income and you're generating some income and you have some expenses, well now you can, and I recommend you work with an accountant here, but now you can write off some of your expenses, which could help you get some of your money back from the IRS. But again, this is where things get a little bit more complicated. And I'm gonna say this one more time. This is where it becomes extremely important for you to begin working with a licensed advisor. That way you can keep the most money in taxes. The second thing that you want to do is you want to create a financial system with your money or give a job to every dollar that you earn. By the way, I should also mention that I did an interview with my accountant on different tax breaks that you could potentially qualify for. If you want to watch that video on YouTube, I'll link it for you down in the description. You might find some value in that. But now when it comes to giving a job to every dollar that you earn, the key thing that you have to understand is that some of the money that you earn is going to be used for your spending. Some of the money that you earn has to be used for your investments and some of the money that you earn should be put aside for your savings. Now, the reason why this is so important is because most people earn money to spend money. Most Americans are working to spend money to buy a faster car. Most Americans are working to earn money to spend their money on a new vacation. Most Americans are working to earn money to spend their money at Gucci. Now, while that's nice, the reality is that's never going to make you wealthy, period. What wealthy people are doing, and people who aspire to become wealthy are doing, is the first thing they do is they understand, I cannot spend all my money. If I earn $1,000 after taxes, I cannot spend all this money because then you have no money to actually build any wealth. And then the next thing that people think is, well, okay, if I want to build wealth, I earn $1,000 after taxes, I'll spend most of it, and I'll save the rest. I'll save $100 out of my $1,000, I'll spend the other $900, and I'm good. Well. I hate to break it to you, but you will never, ever, ever be able to become wealthy by saving your money. This dynamic of saving your way to wealth does not work in today's economic climate. Maybe it worked for your parents, or your grandparents, but it does not work today because of inflation. Your savings are not growing fast enough to keep up with the rising cost of living. So now, what do you do to combat that? 
you have to invest your money. Now, this can become scary, especially if you didn't grow up in a household talking about investing or financial education, because when you hear the topic of investing, you think risk. What if I lose my money? What if the stock market crashes? What if something happens to the real estate market? What if the economy goes down? I could lose half of my money overnight. Well, yes, that is a risk, but there's also a risk of you not investing your money. Because if you don't invest your money, well, not only are your savings going to lose value to inflation, which is a guaranteed loss, but the money you spend is a guaranteed loss as well. Because when you take that $1,000 and you spend 900 of it at Gucci, at Lululemon, at Chipotle, all 900 of those dollars are gone and you're never going to have a chance to see any of that money again. And this is where what wealthy people want to do is they want to emphasize this. They want to invest their money aggressively because this is what's going to allow you to build wealth. Now, I'll talk about the different ways that you can invest your money in part number three, but this is where now you have to give a job to every dollar that you earn. And one of the things that I like to do is create three different bank accounts. Have a bank account for your spending money, have a bank account for your investing money, and have a separate bank account for your savings money. And the reason why you want to create three different bank accounts is so you accidentally do not spend your investment money. Because when it's in three different bank accounts, you're going to look at that money very differently. If you only see $650 in this account, and you go into that store and you see the $1,000 phone that you cannot finance, well, now you're going to realize, oh, I don't have the money to buy that phone. And that's going to make you think twice, as opposed to if you had all the money in one account. So the simplest thing that you can do is go to your bank, create three different bank accounts, and then you can create an automatic withdrawal and deposit, which says that now every time I get paid, some of this money is going to go into this bank account for my investing money. And some of this money is going to go into my savings account, which holds my savings money. Now you can find the right percentage that works for you. One of the things that I like to say is something like a 75, 15, 10 plan to start, which says for every dollar that you earn from here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you should be investing, and 10 cents is the minimum that you're saving. Now, when it comes to your savings, there is a cap to how much you should save, and that cap is going to depend on really your financial situation because your savings are not there to make you wealthy. Your savings are there to protect you against a financial emergency. Your savings are there to protect you in case your car breaks down, in case your window breaks, in case your kid's arm breaks. That's why you want to have savings, that way you have some cash to fall back on so you don't have to go into credit card debt when life happens, because let me tell you something, life happens. That's why it's called life. So how much savings should you have? Well, somewhere between three months and 12 months worth of expenses, depending on where you are in life. If you're 24 years old, you don't really got any financial expenses or liabilities, and you're open to taking on a whole bunch of risk, you don't need a year's worth of expenses saved up. Be more aggressive with your investments. You got time on your side. Maybe you only need a few months worth of savings. Now, if you're 45, 48 years old, you got kids you have to save up for, you have a spouse to take care of, you got other financial liabilities you want to take care of. Now it makes sense for you to have six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year's worth of expenses, depending on where your risk tolerance is. If you don't really have a very high risk tolerance, then you can have a bigger savings cushion. If you have a higher risk tolerance, then maybe all you need is six months. But this is where you have to kind of think about how much money do you want to save? Once you hit that savings goal, then what I want you to do is take this 10% that you're saving and put that money here into your investments. That way now, instead of investing 15%, you're investing 25% of your income because, well, you've already built the savings cushion. More savings is not going to do you any more good. So take this money, put it into your investments. Now you can invest more aggressively. But now what you're doing is you've assigned a job to every dollar that you earn and your money is automatically being transferred. So you built a system for your money and now you know I cannot spend my investment money because this is the money that's going to make me rich. This is the money that's going to make me look rich. Most people focus on looking rich more than they do on actually getting rich. And that's why most Americans are product rich, but investment poor. But if you really want to become wealthy, you got to become investment rich. And well, I guess you don't have to be product poor, but if you sacrifice some of this, well, that's going to allow you to become wealthy here. It's kind of the ironic thing that the people that look the richest oftentimes don't have the assets to show for it, but the people who have all the assets, they don't feel the need to show it off the way that somebody who doesn't have the assets needs to. Now, whether or not you want to buy the Gucci Louis Vuitton, I'm going to leave that up to you, but the key is I want you to own the assets first. Once you understand this, this is where you have to understand number three, how do you grow your money? How do you invest your money? How do you build that wealth? Now, this is where things really start to get fun because when we talk about growing your money, the whole idea here is you're now putting your money to work. That way it can work and generate you money even when you're not working. 
And this is where real financial education comes into play. And if you do like learning more about this type of stuff, I do want to let you know that we have a free ebook on how to build wealth as an investor, even if you don't have any experience as an investor. This is an ebook written by my company, Briefs Media. It's completely free. I got the link for you down in the description below, but it walks you through how do you build a financial system? How do you build a wealthy mindset? How do you save your first couple thousand dollars? How do you start generating cash flow from your investments? Different investment ideas, and just kind of walks you through step-by-step step, different things that you can do to start investing your money, building your wealth, and potentially generating cash flow, depending on how you want to invest your money. So if you want to read this ebook, that's completely free, and I got it for you down in the description. Now, the whole idea behind growing your money is you're taking the money that you put aside towards your investments and you're going to use this money in the most strategic way possible that way this money starts to grow and could potentially create a new income stream for you without you having to work but there's a couple things i want you to understand about this number one is let's talk about some ideal returns when it comes to investing your money because when it comes to investing your money you have a lot of people on the internet talking about oh throw your money into this investment and get a 200 percent return and well that sounds exciting it's not sustainable and while some people could get that one year, maybe two years, maybe three years, it's not sustainable. And the fast money is also the fastest money to go away. And so if we talk about sustainable returns, generally what you have seen in the past from the historical stock market returns is that the stock market and the real estate market generally grow by an average of seven to 10% a year. This is what we have seen over the last century. Now, does this mean that the stock market and real estate market always grow by 7 to 10%? No, this is an average. That means some years it grows more, some years it grows less, some years you see losses. We have seen market crashes, we've seen real estate crashes. This has happened many times over the last century. But after factoring in the crashes, after factoring the big boom years, this is what we have seen as the average. So when you understand this, I also want you to play this against debt. Because if you have any sort of high interest debt, maybe you have credit card debt, and if that credit card debt is costing you, let's just say 18% a year, well now let's think about this. Your credit card debt is costing you 18% a year. When you go and invest your money, you're trying to get a 7 to 10% a year. Which number is bigger? Now, you might be wondering, why am I saying it like this? Well, because I have seen many people with 18 to 28% credit card debts that are asking, how should I be investing the rest of my money in the stock market? And this is where I want you to understand, you're trying to get a seven to 10% return in your stock market portfolio or real estate portfolio. But if you're paying 18% on your credit card, it makes more sense for you to take your investment money and work to pay down your high interest debt first. Because if you can stop paying a credit card debt one year early, that is a guaranteed 18% return on your money. Now, if you take the same money and you put it into the stock market, you might be able to get a 7% return. You might be able to get a 10% return. You might be able to get an 18% return, but you might also lose money. So now you have risk here. You could make less. You could make the same. You could make more, but it's risky. This is guaranteed. So if you have high interest debts, one of the things that I always like to say is pay down your high interest debts, your credit card debts, before you go out and start talking about how do you invest your money in stocks and real estate. Now, the next question everybody has is, well, where should I put my money? Should I put it in stocks? Should I put it in real estate? Should I put it in ETF? Should I put it in index funds? Should I put it in mutual funds? Should I put it in individual companies? And this is where you can really get overwhelmed with the amount of options that are out there. Because now you might see the next hot stock, you might hear about Tesla on the news, you might hear about Apple on the news, you might hear about this brand new mutual fund on the news. And the reason why many people don't become wealthy isn't because they picked the wrong stock, or it's not because they picked the wrong mutual fund, or it's not because they picked the fund with the wrong expense ratio, it's because they never got started. Now, of course, there's a con to picking the wrong investment. However, the key, the key, to building long-term wealth is getting started. Because even if you pick the wrong investment, at least you're getting started. And what happens, even if you make the wrong investment, is you are starting to learn. Losing is a part of the process, which you'll see in pretty much every one of my disclaimers, is you're virtually guaranteed to lose money. Every single successful investor in the history of time has lost money. And if you're really scared about losing money, well, then you're never gonna get started. And if you never get started, you're never gonna see the success. But in order to get the success, you gotta get started and you have to be willing to lose money because unfortunately, losing is a part of the process. However, the goal is to make way more than you lose. Because when you have skin in the game, when you actually start investing your money, 
you're going to be much more willing to learn. And this video can go on for hours talking about how to analyze a stock, talking about how to analyze a real estate investment, and we go over that in the ebook. But what I want you to understand is the first thing you got to do is just get started. You don't got to throw your entire investment portfolio into one thing, but you have to get started. Start with $10. Start with $100. Start with something you're very comfortable with losing. Understand that when you invest that money, you could lose all of it. So don't go and just dump your entire life savings into an investment, but get started slowly. Dip your toes in the water and then start learning. Because then what you're going to realize is maybe you hate the stock market. Maybe you hate analyzing individual companies and you just want to throw your money into an S&P 500 ETF. Meaning you just want to invest your money into a fund that's giving you exposure to the largest 500 companies in the stock market. Now, you don't have to worry about analyzing companies. You don't have to worry about trying to time the markets. You just put a little bit of money in every week, and now you set it on autopilot and don't have to worry about it. Maybe you realize, oh yeah, I like analyzing companies. I like listening to earnings calls. I like studying financial statements. I like looking at the balance sheet. I like looking at the income statement. I like valuing a company. And I'm actually pretty good at it. So maybe now you don't invest in these funds. You're looking for individual companies. Maybe you say, I hate stocks. I like investing in real estate. I like being involved. I like working with tenants. I like working with management companies. I like building systems and processes. And so maybe you'll go into real estate. But you gotta get started because if you don't start, you're not gonna know what you like. You're not gonna know what you're good at. And you're not gonna know what you wanna do because the same investing strategy is not gonna work for everybody. Some people are gonna work better in the stock market. Some people are gonna work better with passive investments like ETFs and index funds and mutual funds. Some people are gonna work better with individual stocks. Some people are gonna work better by investing in real estate. Some people are gonna work better by investing in startup companies. But in order for you to figure it out, you have to get started. And the way for you to get started is by number one, not spending all of your money and having money to invest. You can see if somebody's going to become financially rich or middle class or financially poor based off of how they use their money. And the reason why is because every single person and every single business should have three different financial statements. Number one is your income statement that shows your income minus your expenses. Number two is your balance sheet, which shows your assets minus your liabilities. Many people like to call this a net worth statement. And number three is your cash flow statement, which says, where did the cash move from your bank accounts? And what most people do, the middle class, is they make money and then they spend money. And then they spend this money to buy a whole bunch of these liabilities. So middle class people are making money here. It flows out here to buy more of these which don't really make you any wealth. What poor people do financially is they make money here and then they spend it here but not through their own cash. They do it from other people's cash with the help of credit cards, financing, and other forms of debt. So now you're financing these liabilities with other people's money versus what wealthy people are working to do is they make an income here and they want to take as much of this income and put it here into these assets because these assets will continue to pay you with more income. Now, the first time I ever heard of this type of financial situation was through Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, because the first time that I read his book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, well, that was the first time I ever got any exposure to any sort of financial education. But then as I started to go through my own financial education journey, as I started to get my own accountants, I started to really see this in play for myself. Because what you'll see happen is most Americans, and this really applies around the world, but I'll focus on America because that's where I am. Most Americans are working here for a bigger income. That way they can have a faster car, a bigger home, and nicer vacations, meaning so they can have higher expenses. And if you are trying to be like the top of your game, now you don't want to finance your vacation. You don't want to have excessive payments on your car. You don't want to have excessive payments on your home. So you just want to have the right amount of expenses that meet your income. And this is where now most Americans are making money, spending money, and then if there's any money left, they'll invest it here and maybe you'll have a 401k, although your 401k was never intended to be your sole retirement plan and your 401k probably won't be enough for you to live a completely financially free lifestyle, which is why you need to understand how this system works because if you keep doing what everybody else does, you're gonna end up like everybody else and in today's financial situation, that's broke, unhappy, and unfulfilled. And now I'm not gonna talk about the happiness and fulfillment side of your life. There's a bunch of content on YouTube that already goes over that. I want to talk about the financial side because the reality is this can be flipped. The way people and businesses can become wealthy is you got to have more assets than liabilities, period. 
And so this is where then the next big mistake that a lot of people make is they confuse assets for liabilities. Because then people will think that certain items that you're using, like your car or the home that you're living in, are assets, when in reality, they're just liabilities. Because that car that you're driving is losing value each and every day. And the home that you live in, well, yeah, it could potentially go up in value, and you could potentially sell it for a profit, but until you sell the home for a profit, it's a liability. It's a money pit. It's taking money out of your pocket. You have to keep paying for property taxes. You have to keep paying for the interest out of your own pocket. You have to keep paying for the insurance. You have to keep paying for the upgrades. You have to keep paying for the maintenance. You have to keep paying for all the repairs. So that home, which you think is an asset, is costing you money each and every day. And the only way that you're going to be able to pull any cash out of this home is if you can sell it for a profit or you have to pull some cash out through refinance. But now you have even more liabilities. And this is where what wealthy people are working towards is they want to create income out of this because the home that you're living in isn't paying you anything. It's not creating you an income, but you can buy other assets that will pay you with an income and you don't need a ton of money to start. In fact, you can start investing your money with as little as $100, even $10, but the key is now you have to understand the way that the system works. Number one is you cannot keep doing this system. This is what the financially poor are doing, which is where now you're using financing to finance these liabilities, these expenses. Meaning now you're using a credit card to buy that Gucci wallet, you're using your credit card to finance the vacation. It has become very accessible to do this now thanks to things like credit card and buy now, pay later systems, or as I like to call it, broke now, broke later. But now what you're doing is, well, you're living your lifestyle based off somebody else's money. And now you're going to have to work not only to pay those things back, but then to pay for interest and then to pay for your lifestyle tomorrow as well. So you're really just running backwards when you're using other people's money to finance these expenses. So that's the first thing that you want to do. Number two is you don't want to get into that middle class mindset, which is now I am working for nicer stuff. I'm working to buy a nice watch. I'm working to buy a big home. I'm working to buy a bigger vacation. I'm working to drive a faster car. When you do that, you make more money, you spend more money, and you have no more money to invest here. The key now to becoming wealthy is to understand the financial statements of a wealthy person because what a wealthy person does is they make money, they want to spend as little amount of this money as possible, that way they can convert this income into these assets. And for me, I prefer cash flow producing assets. I'll explain what that means in just a minute. But they're working to convert this income into assets because now these assets will pay you with more income. And now, when you're making money out of your assets, you can use this money to fund your expenses whether it's a vacation, whether it's a car, whether it's a watch, whether it's fancy handbags, whether it's really whatever you want, because now this is money that you're getting without having to work hard. This is money that you're getting by working hard. Wealthy people don't want to spend their hard-earned money on dumb things like a fast car. They want to use their hard-earned money to buy these assets, which will then fund their dumb things like a fast car. And this is that number one mindset shift, but also that financial education shift that most people were never taught. But the reality is, this is where wealth is built. You have to understand how to play this game if you want to actually win in the game. Now, the question is, what do you do to actually make that happen? And the very first thing, because the reality is every single person is going to run into difficulties in life and you want to make sure you have some sort of cushion to be able to protect you against these sort of financial setbacks. So at the very least, go out and start by putting aside at least $2,000 and this is cash to protect you against an emergency. This $2,000 is not there to go out and buy a new TV or to buy a vacation. You want to put this $2,000 into an account that you do not touch unless you run into an emergency. Once you get that $2,000, the next thing that you want to do is you want to work to pay down your high interest debts. If you have things like credit card debts, if you have things that you bought at 0% APR and now you're paying the 20 to 25% interest, if you have that buy now, pay later stuff, then now you have to pay the interest because you couldn't pay it off in time. Well, this is what you want to be working to pay off as fast as possible. Because when you have these types of high interest debts, they are literally skinning you alive. It is like walking around with chains and shackles because now any time you try to build more wealth, you have to go out and pay all this interest in debt. And so when you had the high interest debt, you're paying for everybody else's perks and you're paying for all those big bonuses that the bankers and the credit card companies are paying out to their employees. And this is where right now what you want to do is pay down that high interest debt as fast as possible. Once you do that, 
Now you can start building a system of how you can start investing your money. And the reason why you want to pay down this high interest debt first, and the reason why you want to have a little bit of savings first, is because if you went out and you tried to invest your money in, say, the stock market, well, the historical stock market return average is somewhere between 7 to 10 percent a year. Now, that doesn't mean that's what it goes up every year. Sometimes it goes down less, sometimes it falls, sometimes it goes up a little bit more. But if the average is 7 to 10 percent a year, and you're paying 18 percent on your credit card, it does not make sense for you to try to get a 7 percent return in the stock market, when if you pay down your credit card one year early, you could save 18 percent a year in interest on your credit card. So you got to pay down the high interest debt early, and then once you pay down the high interest debt, that's when you want to start working now to start investing your money. And this is where you can figure out what types of investments that you want to make, whether it's for cash flow, whether it's for appreciation. Now, if this is something that you're looking for step-by-step -step guidance on, my team at Briefs Media put together this amazing free ebook that you can download called How to Build Wealth as an Investor. In this ebook, you're going to get step-by-step -step instructions on how do you change your mindset, to how do you build your financial base, how do you save your first $2,000, to how do you start investing your money, how can you generate cash flow, how do you spend your money, how can you earn more money and how do you protect your assets? This ebook has a ton of value. If you want to read this ebook, it's completely free. And I'll put the link to how you can download this ebook down in the description below. So if you want to read this ebook, I got the link for you down below. I like investing for cash flow. And what cash flow means is now I get paid for owning an asset as opposed to selling an asset for a profit. So let me diagram what this looks like for you because there's a number of different assets that can pay you with this type of cash flow. So now let's imagine you went out and you invested in this box. Most traditional investments will say something along the lines of your goal is to buy this for $100 and then sell it for, I don't know, $1,000, which would be actually a great investment. But if you can do that, well, now you don't make any money until you ultimately sell. And once you sell, you no longer own this asset. But what I like to do with most of my investments, not all of them, but most of my investments, is I want to buy this asset. And now instead of focusing on the sales side, because, well, it could take years or decades for me to see the growth that I want, I want to start getting some cash just for owning this. So now whether this goes up to $1,000 or down to $50, I want to keep getting a little bit of money into my pocket, whether it's every month, every quarter, or every year, just for owning this asset. Now the question is, what can this asset be? One option is dividend paying stocks. This is now where you're going out and investing in companies that pay out a little bit of cash flow, generally quarterly, meaning every three months, for you doing nothing except owning that stock. Now not every company pays out these types of dividends, but some companies do. Another example of this would be you going out and investing in physical real estate. Now this one takes more money, this one takes more time, and this one takes more effort, but if you go out and you buy a property, you can rent it out to somebody else. And if we do it correctly, that person who is now living in your property will be paying you rent. And this rent, if you do it properly, should cover your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your management fees, and any vacancy costs you have, plus any debt, and then put a little bit of money into your pocket every single month. So now I'm working to buy these types of assets that will pay me a little bit of money every month. Because then my game becomes, how can I stack this cash flow? How can I buy more of these assets but buy more of this cash flow? Now, if you're thinking, but just breathe, I don't have $100,000 to go out and buy rental properties. That's okay. You don't have to. If you want to go out and buy rental properties, fine. You're going to need money, and that's something you want to start saving for. That way, you can then build the cash to go out and buy a rental property. But if you're not interested in going out and investing in real estate, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to invest in real estate to go out and make money. Although, you do see some people on the internet talking about how you have to buy real estate if you want to build wealth doesn't work like that. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy without ever touching real estate. You have some people that have become incredibly wealthy without ever touching stocks. You just got to find what's right for you. I invest in stocks, but I also invest in real estate. So now, if you don't want to go out and invest in real estate, or if you don't have the funds to go out and invest in real estate, what are the alternatives? Well, if you still want to stay involved in real estate, there are some real estate funds on the internet that you can consider investing in. However, if that's not interesting to you too, you can look at, again, stocks because you can start investing in stocks with as little as 10 bucks. And so now, if your goal is to just generate cash flow, you could potentially create a system where now you take whatever amount of money that you want, and then every week you create an automatic system. This money gets automatically invested out of your checking account, it gets pulled, and then it gets into a portfolio of your dividend paying stocks, your dividend paying ETFs, your dividend paying index funds, your dividend paying mutual funds. It does not matter. And now you're just working to keep stacking the cash flow. 
For me, I have a system where every Wednesday, I have cash that leaves my checking account, and I picked Wednesday just because it's in the middle of the week. I have no secret sauce as to why. But every Wednesday, cash leaves my checkings account, and it goes into my portfolio of ETFs. Now, an ETF is a fund. So instead of me going out and investing in an individual company, which I do as well, it's a different strategy. I'm not talking about that right now. But an ETF now is where if you invest in this one fund, you can get exposure to hundreds of stocks. For example, just an example, I'm not telling you what to invest in. If you invested in the ETF SPY, this one ETF will give you exposure to the S&P 500, which is a group of the 500 largest companies in the stock market. So you have ETFs that give you exposure to things like the S&P 500. You'll have some ETFs that give you exposure to the entire stock market. You'll have some ETFs that'll give you exposure to dividend paying companies. You'll have some ETFs that'll give you exposure to healthcare companies. You'll have some ETFs that'll give you exposure to healthcare companies and on and on and on and on and on. So for me, I have ETFs that I invest in just primarily for their dividends. So now, every Wednesday, cash leaves my checkings account. It goes into this portfolio, some of these which are primarily dividend focused. And now these dividend paying ETFs will pay me with money. Now, when I get paid this money, I don't go and take it and spend this money. I use this money to reinvest back into here to buy even more cash flow producing assets. So every week, I'm taking some money and I'm putting it here to buy some of these assets. Then as these assets pay me, I use them to buy more assets. So I'm building this machine to create new incomes because my goal is to stack the cash flow. And then eventually when I'm ready, I can start using this cash flow to fund other things in my life. Because, well, the goal is to be able to live your lifestyle based off of your cash flow instead of the income that you're working to earn. Because when you keep using your income to fund your lifestyle, you're never going to have a chance to actually become truly wealthy because wealthy people want to live off of their assets, not their income. Now, of course, if your assets are paying you an income, that's completely different. I'm talking about the income that you're working to earn from your job or even your salary from your own business. You want to be able to live off of the income from your assets, the income that you don't have to work to earn because that income will keep paying you even when you're not working, and that's what wealthy people are working for. Most people will tell you that the bigger your salary is, the better your chances are to become a millionaire. Well, turns out that's wrong. Take a look. Doctors are arguably the highest paid professionals in America, and a new study by Ramsey Solutions found that teachers are becoming millionaires more often than doctors. Now, as soon as I saw this report, I did two things. Number one, I sent this report to my parents because growing up in a traditional Indian house, you were required to become a doctor if you want to become financially successful. And instead of becoming a doctor, I started making videos on YouTube. How you doing? And then second, I dug into the report to see what the heck is going on. Now, just so we're on the same page, the average public teacher salary in the United States is $66,000 a year, according to USA Facts. And the average primary care physician in the United States is making $265,000 a year. And this is according to the White Coat Investor. Now, what I learned in school is that this number is bigger than this number. So naturally, the person making the bigger number is going to be more wealthy, right? Well, this study says something a little bit different. Now, if you dig into the Ramsey Solution study, and yes, this is Dave Ramsey's company, what you'll see is that the top five careers for millionaires are engineering, accounting, teaching, management, and attorneys. Now, did you notice that out of those top five careers, none of them include a doctor, but it did include teachers. This is where you're probably wondering, well, who's the sample size in the study? And by the way, I will link this article for you down in the description as well. And what it says is that this Ramsey Solution study was done with over 10,000 United States millionaires. And over half or 52% of the millionaires in this study earned a master's or doctoral degree compared to 13% of the general population. So while the study didn't say exactly how many doctors they studied, you have to imagine that there's got to be at least some doctors in the study, and the teachers in the study were outperforming the doctors at becoming a millionaire. But this is where things really start to get fun, because what the study says is that only 31% of the millionaires in the study averaged $100,000 a year over the course of their career, and one-third of them never made six figures in any single working year of their career. That means out of the thousands of millionaires that were surveyed in the study, one out of three out of those millionaires never made more than $100,000 in a year. So if it wasn't the big salary that made them rich and wealthy, what was it? Well, it came down to two things. It came down to consistent investing 
keyword consistent. And the second thing was smart spending. The common trend amongst the millionaires in this study wasn't that they grew up with rich parents. It wasn't that they grew up with a bunch of financial education. It was that they made that conscious decision to want to become wealthy in their lifetime and they changed their lifestyles because of it. Take a look. Eight out of 10 millionaires come from families at or below middle income level. Only 2% of the millionaires surveyed said they came from an upper income family. Once these people made that conscious decision to want to become wealthy, it was the consistent investing that allowed them to become wealthy. It wasn't them going out and finding a huge chunk of cash, starting to invest it, and waiting all this time to start investing. It was starting to invest with small amounts of money and continuing to invest again and again and again, week after week after week, month after month after month, recession after recession after recession. It does not matter if you're going through a market boom or a market crash. You just continue to keep investing and you just keep doing it year after year after year, decade after decade after decade. 75% of the millionaires in the study said that this consistent investing was what allowed them to become a millionaire in their lifetime, even if they weren't making a big salary. Now, before we dig deeper with number two, if you do want to learn more about how to start investing your money and how to start building your financial education, we have this free ebook at Briefs Media called How to Build Wealth as an Investor that will walk you through the basics of number one, how do you build a wealthy mindset to then how do you start investing? How do you start generating cash flow? How do you spend your money smartly? How can you earn more money smartly? And how can you protect your assets? This ebook is completely free. And if you want to read this ebook, I got the link for you down in the description below. Now, this is where the smart spending ties into the consistent investing because when it came to the smart spending, in order for people to be investors, they had to spend their money smartly. That meant they weren't going out and eating at fancy restaurants. They weren't going out and financing these fancy vacations. They weren't going out and blowing money on things like fancy cars that they couldn't afford. They lived within their lifestyle and within the lifestyle meant not only did I not spend all my money, but I spent less than all the money that I generated. That way I had money to keep investing. And a big difference now between the high income earners and let's just say the average income earners wasn't just the income but also not the cost to get that income. Take a look. This national study of millionaires showed that it's the degree itself that matters, not where the degree comes from. Almost two-thirds of millionaires graduated from a public state school, while only 8% went to a prestigious private school, but the bulk of millionaires did get that piece of paper. And the reason why this information matters is because of none other than student loans. This is from educationdata.org, and what it says is that the average physician ultimately pays $135,000 to $440,000 for an educational loan plus interest. So now if you look at the numbers, if you go out and become a doctor, you might be making $265,000 a year, but the cost in order to get this $265,000 a year salary is going to be somewhere between $135,000 to $440,000. Could it be less? Sure. Could it be more? Sure. But then you have the second part beyond just the student loans that you got to pay back plus interest, which is you got to live the doctor lifestyle. This is an article by Healthcare Communications Network and it's titled, Why Doctors Go Broke and How to Avoid It. And the subheader of this article is that physicians are trapped between high earnings and high expenditures. This now goes back to the smart spending point that I was talking about just a minute ago. If you're making money and you spend all of your money, it doesn't really matter how much money you make because you have no money to consistently invest. And what we're seeing now from a number of studies is that you have some doctors, again, this does not apply to every single doctor, but you have some doctors who don't have financial education. Now that is very unfortunate because you go through all this schooling to make a high income, but you never learn along the way how to manage your money, how to invest your money, how to grow your money, and how to protect your money because most schools don't teach any sort of financial education. So now you go through all these years in school, you go and spend all this money to get your degree, you go and become a doctor, now you're in your 30s, after going through all this schooling, you finally start to make a good salary that you worked so hard to get. And then you gotta start paying back your student loans. And then naturally you see everybody else around you driving in a nice BMW, driving in a nice G-Wagon, driving in these nice cars, having big homes, having these nice vacations. And now you naturally think that that's the normal thing to do because every other doctor is doing that because you're making a big salary. And of course you can buy it because you're making the big salary to do that. But then if you're never taught what to actually do with the money, well now you make a lot of money, but you're also spending a lot of money and you have no money to consistently invest. And this is where, again, it goes back to the core of all the videos that I've been talking about. It's not just how much money you make that matters. It's what you do with the money that you make. Can you become a millionaire as a doctor? Absolutely. Can you become a millionaire as a teacher? 
Absolutely. But it's not just the salary that matters. It's what you do with the money that you make. We need doctors who want to be doctors. We need good doctors who care about their patients. We do not need doctors who are going out to become doctors to make big salaries and to make the big bucks because that's what every Indian household is forcing their kids to do. Sorry, mom and dad. But that's what every Indian household is trying to do along with a lot of other families. But this is where understanding that you can become financially wealthy with the right financial education. Can a bigger salary help? You bet it can, but the bigger salary can only help you if you understand how to use your money the right way. So if you wanna become a doctor, please go out and become a doctor and provide good health care to people that need it. But if you want to also become wealthy, which is what everybody should want to do, you have to also start learning on the financial education side of things as well. Most people think that if you want to become a millionaire, you have to make a million dollars. But that's not true. In fact, that's the hardest way to become a millionaire, and I'll show you. There are three ways that you can become a millionaire. You can earn your way to a million dollars a year, you can save your way to a million dollars in the bank, or you can own your way to a million dollars or more in net worth. This one requires the least effort. Not that it's easy, but it requires the least effort, but the majority of people are focused on these two. So let's break this down. Let me start by talking about number one, how do you earn your way to a million dollars a year? Statistically speaking, you are least likely to earn your way to a million dollars a year. The top 1% of earners make $500,000 a year, and the top 0.1% of earners in the world, not the United States, but the world, are making a million dollars a year or more. So if you want to make a million dollars a year, you're probably not going to get that from your job unless you become one of the CEOs of a Fortune 500 company or if you create your own income. This doesn't mean it's impossible. You just have to understand the numbers and then work backwards and then actually make it happen. If you are doing something that makes you $100 per transaction, maybe you're a salesperson, maybe you have your own business, you're selling something, but you're making $100 per transaction, in this case, you're gonna have to sell or make 833 of these transactions a month to make a million dollars in a year. If you can make $500 per transaction, now you only have to make 167 of these transactions a month. If you make $1,000 per transaction, now you only have to make 83 of these sales or transactions a month and if you can make five thousand dollars per transaction now you only need 17 of these transactions a month if you want to go from wherever you are now to a million dollars a year saving your way to a million dollars was originally the way that i thought that you had to become a millionaire but let's do the math to understand what this means let's assume that you start working when you're 21 years old and you start making fifty thousand dollars a year when you graduate college and you are going to save 10% of your income, which in this instance will be $5,000. So now you take this $5,000 and you put it in an account and now your money is going to sit there and accumulate each year that you save money. And let's also assume that you're getting a raise every single year. This way you're actually saving more money each year. And I'm going to assume that your boss is going to give you a guaranteed 5% raise every single year. So that means year one, you make $50,000. When you're 22, you make uh, $52,500, which means you're also going to save $5,250. Well, if you do this, you will become a millionaire. It's going to take you a lot of time. In this instance, it is going to take you 50 years to become a millionaire. So now you're going to be 71 years old. You're going to make about $560,000 a year when you're 71, assuming you get a 5% raise each and every year. And then when you're 71, you're finally going to have a bank account worth a million dollars dollars. It's going to take you 50 years to become a millionaire, but you can do it assuming a few things. One, you keep saving 10% of your income, and two, you get a 5% raise, a 5% increase in your savings each and every year. This is where, again, earning more money can be more valuable, but of course you want to be more strategic with your money. Now, how do you earn more money? Well, you could do it from your job, or you could work to create your own income. This brings me to number three, which is how do you own your way to a million dollars? Now, the first thing you might be saying is, but just please, in the previous example, when you're earning $50,000 a year and you're saving that money, what if instead of you save it, you invested that money? That's one way to own your way to a million dollars. But the second way is a little bit different. So let me start by talking about the first one, then I'll go on to the second way. In this first scenario, if we start by earning $50,000 a year, you invest 10% of the income, which is $5,000 in year one, $5,250 in year two, and on and on and on. Now, when you take this money, this invested money, if you are able to get a 7% return on this money, so you take this $5,000 and you invest it into the market, and let's assume over the long term you get a 7% annual return. Year two, you invest 5250 you invest that money, that gets a 7% return. 
Now, it's not going to take you 50 years to see a million dollar investment account. In this situation, it's going to take you 32 years to see that return on your money. Now, how do you invest this money? Well, you can put this money into index funds that give you exposure to the total stock market. You can invest in index funds that give you exposure to the S&P 500. You can invest in ETFs that give you exposure to the S&P 500 or the total stock market. I've talked about this on multiple videos on my channel. I'll link some for you down in the description as well if you wanna learn more about those. But the key here is when you're putting your money aside, it's not just sitting there, it's going to be growing. And historically, we have seen the stock market grow by seven to 10% a year on average. That doesn't mean it always goes up by 7 to 10% a year. That means on average, after you factor in the market crashes and the booms, it grows by around 7% a year. And the reason why so many people lose money in the market isn't because the stock market doesn't go up. It's because they don't know how to invest their money in the stock market. And one of the ways you can bypass that learning curve is you can just put your money into the market by investing in funds that give you total exposure to the stock market or something like the S&P 500. That way, you don't have to worry about it. So this is one way that you can own your way to a million dollars. But now if you want to be more involved, option number two when it comes to owning it is to actually buy it or create it. So one way that rich people or wealthy people can make a million dollars is you buy something, let's just say a business or a piece of real estate for a million dollars. You do something to increase the valuation of it. Maybe you work to increase the rents. Maybe you work to increase the profitability. And then you sell this business for two million dollars. When you're talking about these big dollar figures, it's not that hard to see people sell a business or a piece of real estate for a lot more than what they bought it for. And when you buy it for a million dollars or $10 million or $20 million, a million dollar gain really isn't that big deal. Now, you might hear that and say, but Jaspreet, how in the world am I going to go do that because I don't have a million dollars to start with? I'm not a rich yet. I'm not wealthy yet. I don't have the ability to go out and buy a million dollar business yet. So what do I do? Well, if you can't go out and buy a million dollar business, you're already doing that option here, right? When you invest your money, you're working to grow that money. Option number two is you can create a million dollar business. Now creating a million dollar business, believe it or not, is easier than earning a million dollars a year because for you to build a million dollar business, you can earn less than a million dollars a year. I'll show you. Many small businesses in America can be sold for five to 10 times earnings or EBITDA. Now, some businesses will be sold at a lower multiple, some will be sold at a higher multiple, but in a general range, you'll see many businesses in America sell between five to 10 times earnings. That means if your business makes a profit, you can take that profit number, multiply it by a multiple, and that can be what your business is worth. Now, there are a lot of stipulations for this because when people buy a business, they want it to be scalable. They don't want it to rely on you because if the business relies on you as a person to be there, then the business really isn't worth that much because if you died or if we stopped working there, the business would go down to zero. So this has to be a real business that you can build or that you can scale in a way that you can move away from the business. This doesn't mean it's impossible or that it's harder. It just means that you have to think a little bit differently and build the business processes a little bit differently. But now let's go through the numbers. If now you run a business that makes $100,000 a year in revenue, then you take off your expenses, which let's assume are $50,000. That leaves you with $50,000 of earnings or profit. Now you can take this $50,000, multiply it by five, which would be $250,000, or multiply it by 10, which would be $500,000. And now this gives you a general range of what your business might be worth if you sold it. Your business in this case might be worth $250,000 to $500,000 if you sold the business, even though you're only making $50,000 worth of profit or 100 grand of revenue. So now, if you want to build a million dollar business, let's do the numbers. We can work backwards now. At a 10 times multiple, that means your business has to have earnings of $100,000 to be worth a million dollars because $100,000 times 10 is a million dollars. And at a five times multiple, that means your business has to net $200,000 of earnings, EBITDA, profit, whatever you want to call it. Multiply this by five, now this is worth a million dollars. Now, you can work even more backwards. If this is the profit that you have to have, now you have to take the revenue minus the expenses, which has to equal this number. How much revenue do you need to make $100,000 or $200,000 a year? Maybe it's $200,000 of revenue in this number. Maybe it's $500,000. Maybe it's a million dollars worth of revenue, depending on what the business does. But now, at least you have a clear target of what type of numbers you need in your business. That way now you can scale the revenue, you can manage the expenses, and have a profit, multiply the profit by multiple, 
and now you have this million dollar business. Now, when you have this million dollar business, you have the option to do three things. Number one is you continue operating the business and you have the salary and you retain the ownership, you own a million dollar business. Option number two is you can sell the business. Now another buyer can come in, they'll buy your business for a million dollars or whatever it's worth, and now you get your million dollars, and now you can go and stay on a beach or do whatever it is that you wanna do. Or option number three is you can take a loan out against your business. Now of course, this has risks associated with it, and so if you do this, you wanna make sure you do it smartly, but now what you're doing is you have a business that's worth one million dollars. And you go to the bank and you say, hey bank, I have this business that's worth a million dollars because I have this much earnings, and so I think I'm worth a million dollars. I wanna take a loan out against my business. It's kinda of like taking a loan out against a property that you own that's worth a million dollars. Now, it's kinda of like a cash out refinance. So you wanna be very smart here because you definitely do not want to choke your business because of debt that you're taking out for your personal life. So again, I'm gonna very much caution you here if you do do this, that there's a lot of risk associated with it. But now you can go to the bank and say, you know what, I wanna take out a $300,000 loan. Now, you take out this $300,000 loan tax-free because a loan, a cash-out refinance, isn't income. So this $300,000 now comes into your pocket. You can spend this money however you want. Now you have the $300,000 that you can use to live your life, and you're gonna pay this $300,000 back from the income from your business. Now, ideally, you're gonna to continue to work to grow this business. That way, now this is gonna go from $1 million to $2 million valuation, more incomes, more profits, more money to pay down the debt, but now you have this money while you still own the business and you can spend this money tax free. This is what you see Elon Musk do. He's made this very popular because he talked about how he didn't receive a salary when he was running Tesla. But this is where now once you build the business, you have a lot of opportunities of what you want to do with the business. But the whole idea here is if you want to make a million dollars or be a millionaire, you don't have to go out and necessarily just earn that money. You don't have to necessarily save that money. You can own your way there. Obviously, if you don't want to build a business, you can do that by investing your money, invest it into stocks, invest it into real estate. There's a lot of different ways to do that. I have other videos on my channel where I talk about that. Or you can build a business that's worth a million dollars. When you own a business that's worth a million dollars, you can sell it for the million dollars. You can just own it and own a million dollar company. Or you can refinance out against it and then take out some cash against your business and then use that cash to live off of. But that does come with the most risk. Most people say that the secret to not being broke is to never go inside another Starbucks. But that's not true. If you really don't want to be broke again, there are 15 things I want you to do and I'll show you. The first thing that I want you to do is grade your finances. And the way that you do that is to take a piece of paper, you can do this on a Google Sheet, an Excel Sheet or whatever, but you need to see where all your money is coming from and where all of your money is going. So you're gonna start by writing your income and your different income sources. This might be your job, it could be your business, it could be your investments. See all the money that came in. Then you're gonna subtract every single expense. Take your credit card statement, take your debit card statement, take your bank statements, and look where all of your money went. Now, ideally, you're gonna categorize this by these are my eating out, these are my groceries, this is everything else. So you're gonna categorize this by the different types of expenses that you have. That way now, you can see your income, you have your expenses, and then you have whatever's left. And then you can see, did you invest this money? Did you save this money? Did you put some of this money to charity? What are you doing with this money? You need to see this in order to actually be able to improve your finances because in business, what they say is if you can't track it, you can't optimize it. Well, it works the same way with your money. If you don't know where your money is going, you have no way to actually improve what you're doing with your money. And the reason why this is so difficult it's because this is almost like giving yourself a report card. Nobody liked getting their grades when you were in math class in high school. Well, now when you do this, you're going to have to take a look at what's actually happening with your money. And I can guarantee you, the first time you do this, you are going to be shocked when you see where your money is going. And immediately, I don't even have to tell you what to do. Immediately, you're going to find ways to cut expenses and have more money. Number two is spend less than what you make. Once you see how much money you brought in, you cannot spend more than that money because if you don't have any money left over, you can't invest your money to build wealth. You can't save your money to protect you and you can't give any money back because you're spending all of your money. This means now you gotta start spending less money strategically. Where can you start spending less money? Well, you gotta see where your money is going in the first place. Maybe you eat out less. Maybe you stop buying so much stuff. Maybe you can't afford to go on those vacations right now. Maybe you can't afford a monthly massage membership. See where your money is going and then see where you can cut back on some of these expenses because if you're spending more than what you bring in, well, you can never 
you will never be able to build wealth. Number three is pay yourself first. And the first time I heard that, I thought that meant that when I pay myself first, I'm gonna spend this money here first. I'm gonna spend money on a nice vacation to treat myself, or I'm gonna buy myself a nice car, or I'm gonna buy myself this nice thing, that way I can pay myself and treat myself. But paying yourself first does not mean treating yourself first, that means building your wealth first, which means always spending money here first investing your money first. And the way that you do that is by creating a system where now no matter how much money you get paid, you always put aside money to invest. You always put aside money to save, and then you spend whatever's left. The biggest mistake the majority of people make when it comes to their money is they spend their money first, and then they save and invest whatever's left. But if you wanna become wealthy, and what wealthy people do is they invest and save their money first, and then they spend whatever's left. The simplest way that you can do that is by following something like a 75, 15, 10 plan, which says that for every dollar that you earn from here on out, 75 cents is the maximum that you can spend. 15 cents is the minimum that you invest. 10 cents is the minimum that you save. Now what you're doing is anytime you get paid, you're always paying yourself first because you're always investing your money. The more money you make, the more money you invest. You're always saving your money. Now a little caveat here when it comes to saving, because when it comes to your saving, you don't wanna just keep saving your money forever. You wanna save your money strategically, and that means saving somewhere between three to 12 months worth of expenses. So figure out what your monthly expenses are, multiply that by three, multiply that by 12, and this will give you a range for how much money you should save. Once you hit that amount of money that you wanna save, then you can stop saving and reallocate this money here to your investments because this is what's gonna make you wealthy, this is what's gonna protect you against an emergency, this is what allows you to live your life and enjoy your life by having the nice things. This is the money that you can spend, and of course, I want you to give back too. Give money to charity, give your time, but I also want you to remember that the more you have, the more you can do. And this is why you want to make sure you can take care of yourself because if you are hungry, you can't feed another hungry person. But if you can fill your cup, if you can take care of your finances, you're going to have the ability to give back and do more. So always give back. But also remember, you need to make sure you take care of yourself that we have the ability to give back because most people talk about the importance of giving back, but they have nothing to give. You got to make sure you take care of yourself that we actually have money and have wealth to give back. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't have to be a millionaire to start giving back, and you can also give back your time. I'm not saying you can't do that. What I'm saying is if you can take care of yourself, you can take more care of other people. The more you have, the more you can give. Number four, if it's not paying you, it's not an investment. If you're walking around paying extra for the Nike, you're paying extra for the Gucci, what you gotta remember is you're a walking advertisement for Nike and Gucci. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. If you like the Nike, if you like the Gucci, and you can afford it, no big deal. But if you're broke, if you're struggling with money, you don't need to be paying a premium to be wearing these brand name products to advertise their stuff to walk around as a walking billboard when you're not getting paid to do that. Because now you're paying Nike, you're paying Gucci to advertise their products. Again, don't get me wrong, nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with having expensive things. There's nothing wrong with having luxury things. I want you to have all the nice things, but I want you to be able to afford it. If you are broke, if you don't have money in the bank, if you don't have an investment, if you don't have an emergency fund, you should not be walking around with Gucci on your belt or with Nike on your feet. You need to have something that can actually take care of your feet and keep your pants off, but you should not be walking around with Nike on your feet and Gucci on your belt. Number five is you can turn your annual income into your monthly income, which means if you're making $50,000 a year right now, guess what? You can potentially turn this into $50,000 a month. And when you hear somebody say that, you're gonna think they lost their mind. Because when you're here making $50,000 a year, going to $50,000 a month is gonna seem like a million miles away. It's not even gonna seem possible in this lifetime. But the reality is, it is possible. Does that mean it's easy? No. And is it gonna happen by doing the same thing that you're doing right now? No. But it is possible, but it's gonna require you to first understand and believe that it's possible, and then work to actually achieve this. Now. What do you actually do to achieve this? The first thing you gotta do is start learning about how you can earn more money. What can you do to create an income? What can you do to build a business? What can you do to create a new stream of income that can allow you to 10x how much money you're making? Where can you figure this out? If only there was a platform on the internet that allowed you to watch and learn from other successful entrepreneurs where people could talk about what they did and you could see what they did and watch it happen in real time without you even having to pay anything. If there was only a platform on the internet, 
it. Start by watching YouTube videos, then read books, then take action, then maybe buy some classes, then take more action, then maybe buy some coaching. The more you do, the more you'll realize that making more money is possible, but you're gonna have to put in more work and you have to do more learning to try new things and figure out new ways to earn more money because sometimes all we need is a little taste of knowing that it's possible to earn more money. And once you have that taste and you have the drive and you have the desire and you have the willingness to learn, then nothing can stop you. Number six, get rid of a car payment. The average new car payment in America right now is $717 a month. Do you know what this means? This means that if you're worried about gas prices, you can't afford this new car payment. $717 a month for a new car payment is the highest number we've ever seen. Now, of course, let me give you the normal analysis that everybody does. If instead of having a car payment, you took the $717 a month and you invested it, and let's say you could get just a 7% annual return on your money, which is below the historical average, if you just invested your money into say the S&P 500, and you did this for, I don't know, 40 years, well, instead of having a car that's worth nothing in 40 years, you would have almost $2 million. Now, you're gonna be saying, but just breathe. I still need a car to get to and from work. What do you want me to do? Well, what you can do is take the $8,000 down payment that you put to buy this car, and instead of using that as a down payment to buy this car, take that $8,000 and use it to go out and buy a car with cash. Yeah, you're not gonna get the BMW, you're not gonna get the Benz, but you're gonna get a nice Toyota, maybe a nice Honda. And now, this car will take you from where you gotta go to where you gotta go without this expensive car payment, without the premium gas, without the expensive insurance, and now you don't have to take this money and give it to your car dealership or your bank every single month. You can take this money and put it to work. That way it can actually make you richer instead of just making BMW and Mercedes-Benz richer. Number seven is make less speculative investments. When most people are in the early stages of trying to build wealth or start investing, we get attracted to this old idea of trying to get rich quick. Now, most people don't actually know it's get rich quick because we've all heard that get rich quick schemes don't work. So instead, what do we do? We look for the next hot meme stock. We look for the next hot cryptocurrency. And then we dump our money into these things which make money for some people, but everybody else ends up losing a big chunk of their money. And so instead of looking for the next hot stock or the next hot thing, invest your money into something a little bit less speculative that's gonna make you money over the long term. And I learned this lesson the hard way too, because when I first started investing a long time ago, I started getting into this idea of day trading because people kept talking about how much money you can make day trading. And then I learned about this thing called penny stocks. Now you can day trade penny stocks and you could double your money in a day. And it was very addicting and very exciting. And so I took a whole summer when I was in college and all I did was day trade. I was day trading primarily penny stocks. I would wake up before the bell. I would be researching the articles, researching the forums, and then see what stocks to trade. And all day long, I'd just be making trades. And by the end of the summer, I had spent hours of my life now consumed by day trading. And I don't think I made any money. I don't really think I lost that much money, but I was right around break even after a whole, I don't know how many months. And that's when I realized that I want to be an investor, not a trader. Now, my investment portfolio looks something like this. And of course, I'm not telling you what to do, I'm just telling you what I do, and I should also let you know that investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point, so make sure you understand that before you go in and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. So my investment portfolio looks like this, which is 75% of my investment portfolio are cash flow producing assets. This could be my physical real estate that pays me with cash flow. This could be my stock ETFs that pay me with dividends. And this could be actual stocks that pay me with dividends as well, non-ETF stocks. So 75% of my portfolio are cash flow producing assets. Then I have this smaller piece of my portfolio, which are things like stocks that don't pay dividends. And then I have this part, which is somewhere between 10 to 15, maybe 20% of my portfolio, depending on the day, which is my speculative investments. These are things like the startups that I invest in. These are things like my cryptocurrency investments. These things are speculative. I know that there's a high chance that this could go to zero and there's a high chance that this could also grow very quickly. So many of these or some of these might go to zero, some of them might grow big, at least that's what we hope. But it's very speculative and I also understand that if this went to zero, I really wouldn't be affected that much. And then here I have this teeny tiny piece, about 2% of my portfolio, which is physical gold. 
this is what my portfolio looks like. So I have the 75%, which is paying me with cash flow, whether or not, well, I do anything because this is cash flow producing assets. So now this is a long term portfolio for me because now I'm not looking to sell my portfolio tomorrow in six months or even in six years. I'm looking to hold on, to accumulate, to build, and to grow over the long term. And so for me, when I invest my money, I'm not looking to invest for six months. And if you want to actually make money with your investments, well, you might want to consider not trading, not finding the next hot stock, but rather investing in something that has good long-term value because that can make you way more money over the long term than just trying to trade and finding the next hot stock because that has the most risk which means you can also lose the most money very quickly. Number eight, when you inflate your income, don't inflate your lifestyle yet. The biggest mistake that so many people make when they get a raise, when they get a bonus, or when they get a promotion is they blow all of their money. There are so many people, actually pretty much everybody, who says that their financial problems are because they don't make enough money. And then what happens is you get a raise, you get a bonus, you get a promotion. So you make more money and then all of a sudden, boop, your expenses shoot right up with it because now you got to celebrate. If you get a raise, you got to get a new car. If you get a bonus, you got to go on a vacation. And this is where now, if you actually want to have more money for yourself, when you go and get a new raise, don't go and spend all of your money. And now, if you do that, you can increase your income faster than you can increase your expenses. Now, you will always have more money working to make you wealthier. And every time you get a raise, you will actually become wealthier instead of just looking like you're richer. And if you want to look like you're richer, well, you want to actually become rich and wealthy first because now you have the assets. And when you have the assets that can pay for your lifestyle, now you can buy whatever you want without having to worry about the money because you have the investments that will pay for you. Number nine, don't make emotional financial decisions. And this can be with your investments, panic buying or panic selling. When we hear about the next hot stock all over the news on Reddit and everywhere, people are talking about how much money they're making. It can be very interesting and exciting and you want to come in and buy, maybe even margin up your investments, leverage up your investments, that way you can make even more money. And then on the flip side, when you hear about the market crashing, when you hear about a recession, when you hear about a stock crashing, now you'll want to panic and sell before everything goes down. The markets, especially the stock market, runs a lot on emotion. And the people that actually make money are the people that invest their money, not on emotion. And this is where if you can take the emotion out of the equation, you will have the ability and the psychology to make way more money. But the reason why this is so difficult is because, well, the internet fuels this emotion. The media, traditional media, fuels this emotion. Because when things are good, the traditional media will keep telling you about how the world will never end, about how the money is going to be great forever, and how this stock, this investment, this thing will keep making so much money and you have to come in now before you miss out on the opportunity. Then when things start to go down, it flips. You don't hear, oh yeah, it's having some issues. You hear, the world is ending. You hear this company is going to go down to zero. You hear that everything is going to go down and you need to sell and get out while you can, which creates so much emotion and then... Now on the internet, we have forums, we have people where they can talk to each other and people get emotional and now everybody keeps talking about how the world's going to end or how you can never stop making enough money. And it's this polar extremes in money and polar extremes in emotion which fuels people to do dumb things with their money. And this is where now if you want to make smart spending decisions, if you want to make smart investment decisions, you got to pull the emotion out. I'm talking about your investments right now. But it's the same when you spend money, when you go to the store, instead of just buying things because everybody else on Instagram has it, buying it because you want it or buying it because you need it and then buying it because you can afford it. It's a completely different way of looking at money when you pull that emotion out. Number 10, stop financing things that don't pay you. Just because you can buy something doesn't mean you can afford it. If you have $100 in your bank account, that doesn't mean that you can afford to buy a $200 pair of shoes just because you can finance it. And just because you have $100 in your bank account doesn't mean that you can afford a $100 pair of shoes. Now you might be saying, but Jasprit, what do you mean? If I have $100, why can't I buy a $100 thing because I can buy it with cash and not have to finance it? Well. Now you're spending all your money to go out and buy something that isn't paying you. If you really want to be able to afford something that you don't need to survive, then you can follow my rule of five, which is if you can't buy five of them, you can't afford one of them. With this simple rule, you will know whether or not you can afford something. Number 11, pay off your credit card before you start investing your money. Let's do some quick math. If you put your money in the stock market historically over the last century, you would be getting an average of seven to 10 percent return on your money in the stock market on average. So this is stocks. Now, if you have credit card debt, let's do credit card 
if you have credit card debt, you might be paying somewhere between, I don't know, 12% on the low end to let's say 25% on the high end for credit card debt. Well, these numbers are bigger than these numbers. Meaning, if you work to pay off your credit card debt, that means you will get a faster and better rate of return than if you just invest your money in the stock market. Not to mention, yes, you could potentially earn more money here, but you also have the risk of losing money here versus here, you have a guaranteed return. Because these numbers are bigger than these numbers, you should pay down your credit card debt before you go out and start investing your money because this money, this interest is skinning you alive financially. So pay down your credit card debt and then start investing. Number 12, build a savings fund and then don't touch it unless it's an emergency. Your savings fund is there to protect you against an emergency. Some people, I know Dave Ramsey calls it an emergency fund. This is cash that you're gonna put aside to protect you against an emergency. Your kid's arm breaks, your window breaks, your car breaks down, something bad happens. Now you can tap into this savings fund. Gucci having a sale is not an emergency. Black Friday is not an emergency. This is money that you're gonna put aside for an emergency, something going wrong, maybe you lose your job, that's what this money is for. How much money? Well, like I said earlier, somewhere between three months and 12 months worth of expenses. Then you're gonna take this cash, put it aside, and you don't touch it unless you absolutely need it. Now you might be saying, but just breathe. Isn't this money gonna lose value to inflation? And yes, it probably will. But this money, your savings money, is not there to make you wealthy, it's there to protect you against an emergency. Your investments are there to actually make you wealthy. Your savings are just there to protect you. And so you wanna make sure you have this because then if you run into a financial hardship, well, you have cash to fall back on. Number 13 is if you have extra junk, sell it. My sister-in-law was over at our house over the weekend and we were hanging out in the basement and we had these old lamps there that my grandma had. And she was saying that the lamps that we had in our basement, which were just sitting in the corner, she said that these are now worth thousands of dollars each. I said, what are you talking about? These are just some old lamps. And she said, well, they're trending on TikTok and people are spending top dollar for these lamps. Now, I wouldn't go out and sell these lamps because they were my grandma's, so I want to keep them. But you never know what's going to have value. And if you have something that doesn't have the sentimental value, that's just sitting there collecting dust and you want to make some extra cash, well, you can turn that dust into cash by selling it. Go to Facebook Marketplace, go to Craigslist, go to eBay, go to Amazon, there are so many platforms online where you can now start selling your stuff and you can turn that stuff that's collecting dust, that's wasting space and turning it into some cash. Number 14, this one's gonna be tough, but talk to your spouse. You and your spouse have to be on the same page when it comes to money because if you're there, you're cutting back on your expenses, you're working to earn more money, you're working to invest your money and then you go home and you see your spouse spending all this money on a bunch of things that you think are stupid, well, that's gonna create a lot of fights and it's gonna create a lot of tension. It's gonna create a lot of friction between you two and the relationship side and the financial side. And this is where you gotta have that tough talk with your spouse. And now you gotta sit down and figure out what are your goals together and get each other on the same page of where you're trying to go. How do you sell this to them? Well, you gotta tell them the goals. Because if you say, we're gonna start cutting back on this, this, and this, nobody's gonna wanna do that because why would you wanna cut back? But if you're cutting back a little bit, that way you can have even more in the future that's what you have to sell. You gotta become a little bit of a salesperson here. You gotta sell the vision. You gotta sell the lifestyle that you're going to have, but you have to work to get there together. And if he or she still doesn't believe you, tell them to watch my videos. And number 15, this one might sound like the opposite, but don't chase money. Ironically, when I stopped chasing money, I started making way more money. And I know some people say this like in a real cliche way, but I seriously did because when I first started trying to figure out how to make money, I was doing it just to make money. I started event planning and doing party promoting when I was in college because that's all I really knew and had access to because I was working in the wedding industry. And I was doing it not because I liked it. I actually hated the industry because I was promoting these big club parties, but I didn't drink. I wasn't into partying. I was doing it because I was making money. I was doing it to chase money. And I was making decent money, especially for a college kid. And it got me started and I learned a lot of things. But once I started doing things that I actually cared about, like now I make these videos about financial education, I didn't start the minority mindset to make money. I was busy doing other things. I had other businesses, other things that I was running. I started minority mindset because I really just cared about talking about the things that I wish somebody would have told me when I was getting started on my journey. I started Minority Mindset because I was scammed in a previous business that I was running. So I was just talking about the things that I wish that I knew. That way you don't get screwed over when you start a business. That's why I started. Well, now I make way more money even though I didn't do it to chase money. And so when you really chase that value, you chase the purpose, you chase the mission, you can do a lot more. And the reason why is because now when you're working, you don't feel like working. Now, that's very cliched, and there's a lot of 
untruth to that because there's some things that you're going to do that just do feel like work. Like there's going to be days where it's going to be a grind. There's going to be some things that don't, you don't like doing. Like I don't like editing videos. I don't edit videos anymore, but I never liked editing videos. So there's going to be things that you don't like doing. But the purpose and the mission will drive you to keep learning and to keep going. Because starting something, doing something of your own is difficult. And when you're doing it just for the money, well, once you get the money, you lose that mission. You lose that purpose. And you have no more reason to keep going because you made some money. But when you do it not for the money, you can get the money and keep going because now you're doing it for something even bigger and it allows you to, ironically, attract even more money over the long term. So, figure out what is it that you're actually passionate about? What is the value that you want to solve? What is the pain that you can work to fix? And as you work towards that, what I think you will see is you're going to see the opportunity to make even more money because you're going to be willing to put in way more work, way more effort, and be way more obsessed because you're doing something that, well, other people don't have the same passion as you. We talk about building a business that's scalable. I've talked about that many times, where you want to build something that can grow, that doesn't necessarily need you. That's the definition of scalability, that it can grow and it doesn't necessarily need you to grow. But if you want that business to be able to grow and not need you to grow, you have to do things that can't grow. The C 